to where in Habakkuk, and we're going to just jump right into it. These first five I'll read from the Amplified. I'm going to switch back and forth. I'm trying to get used to my new Bible. If the Lord has me preaching out of this in India, I'll be used to it by the time I get back. Because we're preaching two or three times a day, except for the travel days. So the doors, have, they're just wide open. We're actually, the plan now is that we're going to split up because there's been such a uh, response that Pastor Charles is going to preach some places over here and I'm going to preach some places over here. And we're still going to be preaching two or three times a day. So keep us uh, in prayer. This is, uh, by the grace of God, going to be very, very fruitful. Habakkuk chapter 1. First five verses out of the Amplified. The burden or oracle, the thing to be lifted up, which Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for your help and you will not hear? Or cry out to you of violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and wrong, and yourself look upon the look upon or cause me to see perverseness and trouble? For destruction and violence are before me, and there is strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law is slackened, and justice and righteous sentence never go forth. For the hostility of the wicked surrounds the uncompromisingly righteous. Therefore, justice goes forth perverted. We'll stop at verse 4 for just a minute. So here's Habakkuk, and he has a problem. He has a burden. Habakkuk is a man with a problem. And uh, often we are men and women with a problem. But the good news is, is that Habakkuk was a man of God, and he knew where to take his problem. So often, we want to take our problem to the wrong place, don't we? And uh, sometimes the Lord just has to knock the props out from under us and the securities out from under us so that we'll go to the place that we're supposed to go. Uh, And what we're going to see here is the Lord prophesying and predicting the rise of the Chaldeans, which is Babylon. There was a balance of power in the world. And if you look on a world map where Israel falls, it always seems to fall in the middle of it because it's between three continents. And it was no different 1,600 years ago when uh, this was written. Uh, there was Israel setting there in the middle of three powers. You had the Assyrians, which was uh, based out of Nineveh to the north. You had Egypt, based over to the west. And then you had the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, which were on the rise. They were not a, a world power yet in terms of controlling all of the, the land mass, but they were definitely on the rise. People had their eyes on them. And so, one of the patterns that we have in, in history of the political leaders of Israel was, the, or, and, and Judea actually, Judea is what we're talking about because it's split. You got Israel to the north, Judea to the south. And one of the problems that we have is that the people of God were often looking for political alliances instead of looking to the Lord. It happened over and over and over again. And the Lord actually, many times, and the prophets warns them, He says, Don't go down to Egypt looking for support. You stay steadfast right where you're at. The north has already been carried away by the Assyrians or the Ninevites into a captivity because of their rejection. They've had all these godless kings and, and political leaders. And now here's Judah. But Judah, you've got to understand, Judah are the godly ones. They're the people of God. Okay, They're the ones that say, well, it, it can't come and touch us because we're still God's people. We're the heart you know, of, uh, of the Bible Belt, if you want to say that. Okay, we're the, we're the people that can't be touched no matter where it happens anywhere else. And yet, ungodliness is rising in the land of Judah. And Habakkuk is standing there, and he's saying, God, when are you going to judge these people? This is ridiculous. Now again, you got to remember, Habakkuk was a man that had experienced revival. Because he had to have lived at least partly during the reign of King Josiah. If you remember, King Josiah got everything in order, and even though it was a young king, he restored worship, and he restored the Word of God, and there was a revival. In the midst of the whole earth changing, there was a revival in Judah. But then Josiah you know, dies, goes on to be with the Lord, and uh, his nephew takes the throne, and he's only in power for three months because Egypt disposes him of him, gets rid of him. And so then Josiah's grandson takes power, and he renames himself as Josiah's son. And, and in the archaic language, sometimes we miss what's happening. And Judah is, instead of seeking the Lord, they're trying to reposition themselves politically. They're looking for political answers and political solutions rather than seeking the heart of God. And it's like justice is being turned upside down. 
(laughs) The courts won't make any good rulings anymore. All the politicians are padding their own pockets. It seems like nobody has national pride anymore, but every man is seeking out what's best for himself. Does it sound like a little bit like America today? This is a pattern that's happening in America. And the godly in America, we're saying, just like Habakkuk said, Lord, how long? How long till you judge these people? I don't want my tax dollars to go to killing babies. I don't want homosexuality to be taught in kindergarten class. How long, God, until you judge the godlessness of this nation? They've destroyed, or they've sought to destroy the institution of marriage, the first gift that God gave to man and woman. How long, Lord, until judgment comes? And yet these are the very same things that were happening in Habakkuk's day. Okay, if we can just politically position ourselves and get the right guy in office, right? If just the right king will be raised up, then everything will turn around in the land of Judah. And Habakkuk saying, Lord, why aren't you judging this evil? Why are you being so passive? Habakkuk is a man with a problem. He's got a burden. But he takes his burden to the Lord. And the Lord says, you want to know what's happening in Habakkuk? Let me tell you what's happening. This rising star called the Chaldeans, called Babylon, they're coming in and they're taking over. And we pick up here in verse number 5. This is the Lord replying to Habakkuk. He says, look around you, Habakkuk, among the nations and see and be astonished. Be astounded, for I am putting into effect a work in your days such that you would not believe it if it were told to you. For behold, I am rousing up the Chaldeans, that bitter and impetuous nation, who march through the breadth of the earth and take possession of dwelling places that do not belong to them. So, uh, And he's going to go on to expound this, and we'll look at this uh, briefly here in just a minute. But the pronunciation is given here that God says, okay, Habakkuk, you you really want to know what's happening in the throne room of God? in regards to judgment, if you really want to know and you want to press in and find out, if you really want to bring your burden before me and find out what's happening, he says, I'll tell you. He says, I'm raising up this people, the Chaldeans, and they're going to carry away Judah into captivity. It's always cool when something starts to happen and people see it and they get on, you know, proclaiming the word of the Lord. But Habakkuk's ahead of his time here. Okay, because if we understand the time frame correctly, the Chaldeans, while they were a force to be reckoned with, they were not a world power yet. They were just rising up. And let me tell you, Judah, while it was certainly no superpower, was no little foe. They were strong. It would be like saying today that Russia is going to invade America through Canada. Okay, now, Canada is no superpower, but Canada would be no little foe. Okay, they would have a fight to get through Canada to get to America. They would have a fight. And that's what's happening here. In the natural, it looks like Judah's strong enough, especially with the balance of power that's in the world in that day of Egypt and Assyria, that Judah's probably going to come out of this okay. We're going to live and we're not going to die. The prophet questions the Lord about that later on. But the Lord says, no. You want to know what's happening? You want to know how judgment's coming? I'll show you a plan that's bigger than you. It's bigger than your thinking. It's bigger than you can wrap your mind around. And uh, you said you wanted to know. So here it is. The incredible thing about God being so smart because God is smart. Judgment on the world can also be a time of mercy upon God's people. It's just about being on the right side. God is telling Habakkuk what's coming in forms of judgment. Now, uh, uh, judgment is coming, God is saying, but it's not coming like you think it should come. It's coming the way that I've established it. Now, the Apostle Paul actually quotes this verse in the New Testament. Let's go over there real quickly. Uh, It's in Acts chapter 13, verse 40. Take care, therefore, lest there come upon you what is spoken in the prophets. Look, you scoffers and scorners, and marvel and perish and vanish away, for I am doing a deed in your days, a deed which you will never have confidence in or believe, even if someone clearly describes it in detail 
and declares it to you. Now what Paul is talking about here are uh, those persecutors that were persecuting the Christians. Okay, they, they weren't trusting what Jesus was doing. A lot of people couldn't wrap their mind around this Jesus thing. Because remember, in Paul's day, in Israel, they thought the Messiah was coming back in triumph. He was going to come back. He was going to take over. He was going to turn over uh, the Roman rule and all of this stuff. And they thought because Jesus didn't do that, He couldn't be the real Messiah. They didn't understand the length and the breadth of God's plan. And what Paul is doing is he's cautioning people. He's saying, be careful about rejecting Christ. Because God is working a plan that is so big that you can't wrap your mind around it. Jesus, the Word says, is a stumbling block to those that don't believe. To us, He's a stepping stone, isn't He? I mean, we don't want to walk on Him, but He's a, he's a stepping stone. He's the, the cornerstone. I should say the cornerstone. Thank you, Lord. He's the cornerstone to us. He's the cornerstone of our belief. Everything rests upon Jesus. Jesus is God's plan of redemption. But to those that reject Him, Jesus is God's judgment. Jesus is coming as a Savior, but He's also coming as a judge. Now, uh, sometimes people think that God's being inactive because they don't see what's happening in God's throne room and they don't see what's happening behind the scenes. I read a story about what's happening behind the scenes with ISIS. Uh, but they are based out of Babylonian region, and they're expanding exponentially. I mean, just, you know, the superpowers, Russia and America and you know, so forth, can't seem to stop them with their expansion. They're just killing Christians like you wouldn't believe, martyring believers. In Habakkuk's day, what he's going to say is he's going to say, Lord, how can you use the Babylonians? They're more unholy than we are. And we're going to get to that in a few minutes. But you got this modern day model of this with ISIS. You know how they're conquering and they're, they're, they're expanding and all these things. And as an American believer over here, sometimes our tendency is to look and say, God, why aren't you doing anything? They're killing your people. People are dying in the name of Jesus. There are mass graves being filled with believers. Why aren't you doing something, God? And, that, and as an American, we're looking at that and seeing that. But the thing is, we don't hear the whole report. We don't see the big picture. And I read this article that was talking about what's really happening among ISIS. And one of their major uh, uh, revenues is the sex slave trade. You know, they're capturing the people the children especially, and they're putting them into sex slavery and they're selling them. And that's one of the, that's one of the major, major funding things behind ISIS, what they're doing. <clears throat> and what people don't know, because the media is not reporting this for some strange reason, is that AIDS is more rampant among ISIS than anywhere else in the world. They're dropping like flies on a hot summer's day because of AIDS. Now you would say, how, is that, how does that happen? Well, there's, they believe that there's two ways that it's happening. The first one is, is that because people know that they're coming in to uh, take their people as sex slaves, people are voluntarily becoming infested with AIDS so that they can take it into ISIS because they're going to die anyway. That's one of the ways. But there's another way that they think is more prominent than that. One of the ways that they're said to recruit troops is that they'll come in to a village, they'll capture men that they want to be in their army. And of course, we know that homosexuality is a sin punishable by death in the, the Quran and so forth. But what they'll do, they'll take their camera, they have their people that will go in and sexually molest homosexually the men while they videotape it. And here's their bargaining chip. Either you join our army or we send this out to all your friends and relatives which is the worst thing that could ever happen because they'd be killed anyway. I mean, their friends and relatives would disown them, they'd kill them, they'd whatever. So, hey, it looks like ISIS don't look so bad anymore. But what's happening is that while we don't see it from where we're standing, we're saying, God, why won't you judge them? God, why won't you do something? We just aren't getting the full report. They're dropping like flies because of AIDS because be sure your sins will find you out. And God is not inactive in that situation. Now, God is smart because there are many people, I guarantee you, in that group that have never yet heard a clear presentation of the Gospel and they've never even had a chance to repent. 
So let me tell you, we who have the opportunity to week after week after week after week here of the grace of Jesus Christ, better be careful when we're judging the people who've never heard it once. We better be careful. But God is supernaturally moving by His Spirit and people are having dreams and visions and encounters with Jesus. And many of them are laying down their lives. Again, I can't tell you the validity of this story, but another article that I read a while back, and I'm not getting into the doctrine of this, okay? I'm not, I don't want this to get too far off here. But I'm just illustrating that we don't know the things that's happening behind the scenes. There was a man, he says that he never once even heard the name of Jesus. He was a part of ISIS and he dies. And God told him, because you've never heard the gospel, I'm going to let you live again. I don't know if this is true. I'm just saying I read the article, okay? Don't tell me how it's untrue and all that. I'm just telling you I read the article. The guy uh, comes back to life. He's in a Catholic hospital when he comes back to life. The Catholics tell him the gospel of Jesus Christ. The man gets saved. That's just a story that's out there. Well, maybe he had heard the name of Jesus, but he certainly never had a witness of who the true Jesus was. So we got to be careful throwing our stones. And we got to be careful when we think that we're so pious and so righteous that when judgment comes, that we're never going to be touched by it. we got to be careful of that. And this is a lot of what Habakkuk is about. But what Habakkuk did right was he took his burden to the Lord and he asked God for some answers because in his age, in his day, it looked like things were going great in Assyria. It looked like things were going great in Egypt. It looked like uh, these Chaldeans, you know, they had a good run coming as well. But what God had to reveal to Habakkuk is, hey, Habakkuk, don't worry, judgment's coming. Egypt's going down, Assyria's going down, but let me tell you something, so is Judah, because I won't accept their burnt offerings, their sacrifices, their, their political games, because they think they're so spiritual in Judah, but they're seeking just about every solution except for seeking God. And so judgment is going to come upon Judah too. Now this really isn't a book of judgment as much as it's a book of mercy. And we're going to find that out later. But we're just in the beginning of the conversation this morning. Okay, We're going to have two more uh, discussions of this, and we're going to see the transformation of Habakkuk. Okay, So we're in verse 5, back in Habakkuk chapter 1. And let me read it again. It says, Look around you, Habakkuk, replied the Lord, among the nations, and see, be astounded, astonished, for I am putting and to effect a work in your days such as you would not believe though it were told you. In other words, God's got a plan. God's got His chessboard. God's working something out that you don't even uh, comprehend yet. Verse 6, For behold, I am rousing up the Chaldeans, that bitter and impetuous nation, who march through the breadth of the earth and take possession of dwelling places that do not belong to them. The Chaldeans are terrible and dreadful. Their justice and their dignity proceed only from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and are fiercer than the evening wolves. And their horsemen spread themselves and press on proudly. Yes, their horsemen came from afar and they fly like the eagle that hastens to devour. And so God's given these descriptions of what this up and coming nation is going to be like. And what's pretty cool is that they meet this description to a T as they begin to rise. And that's why a lot of uh, uh, people without faith and biblical critics say that Habakkuk couldn't have been written when he says it was written because it describes them to a T. But how many of you know surely the Lord God does nothing without first revealing it to His servants, the prophets? Amen? So verse number 9, they all come for violence, their faces turn eagerly forward, and they gather prisoners like the sand. Boy, doesn't it sound a lot like ISIS? But I'll tell you what, uh, there, there are the same spirits that are in operation. I'm not saying that... Uh, the, some of these patterns are legitimate. You know, the, uh, there are spirits in operation and dominions and principalities that if we study the Word of God, we'll see those things, right? We'll know how to combat those. And, and largely Habakkuk's about prayer. As you're going to see, we're going to learn a lot about prayer in Habakkuk. Then they sweep in verse 11 like a wind and pass on. And they have loaded themselves with guilt, as do all men, whose own power is their God. Ah, now something starts to change in the attitude of God. See, Habakkuk asked the question, how long, Lord? When does judgment come? When do you settle this matter? Why does this, you know, you know uh, why is 
justice turned upside down, and God begins to answer, ha ha, I got a plan, and these people are tough, and they're fierce, and they're mighty, and they're going to be the first worldwide superpower uh, that's going to be upon the earth, and it's almost like God is boasting them up, and then all of a sudden, God says, but their strength is going to be in their God. And now look what he says. Are not you from everlasting to everlasting, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have appointed the Chaldeans to execute their judgment, and you, O Rock, have established him for chastisement and correction. You see, God is kind of baiting or leading Habakkuk on in this prayer. How many of you know God knows how to lead us on? God knows how to get us to where we need to be. He knows how to get us to the next phase. So Habakkuk comes into prayer with his burden. He's frustrated. He has a chip on his shoulder. He has an attitude. He says, God, when are you going to judge these political leaders and these, this backslidden nation of Judea and not just us, but all these other kingdoms that are around us? And God says, I got a plan. I'm raising up a swift, terrible people. They're going to be incredible like you've never seen and they're going to be strong like you've never seen and they're going to be a world empire and then God baits Habakkuk on and their strength is going to be in their God and as the prophet of God he realizes that's my moment and now the prayer is turned from execute judgment upon Judea the Lord execute judgment upon the Chaldeans upon the Babylonians for they're they're more evil than we are you have appointed them, the Chaldeans, to execute judgment, and you, O Lord, have established him for chastisement and correction. So he's going to, God's going to use the Chaldean people, the evil, evil people, to uh, bring about the judgment and the change needed. Now look at verse 13. It says, and there's kind of a transition here, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil, and you cannot look inactively upon justice. Why then do you look upon the plunderer why are you silent when the wicked one destroys him who is more righteous than the Chaldean oppressor is? See, God had baited him on. He had leaded him on. God gave him an open door. You want to know more? <laughs> Come through the door. Discover some more. Okay? Uh, that's what God does to us in prayer. The Lord never shows us the whole picture, does He? But if we want to know the answer, and if we'll press in with the Lord, if we'll seek the Lord while He may be found, God will always lead us on to the next step. And Habakkuk is here saying, wait a minute. I had a problem before, but now i got a real problem. Okay, because we were talking about judgment, and that's all good. But now you're telling me, God, that you're going to use people that are less righteous than we are to judge us? That doesn't fit into my theology. That doesn't fit into my way of thinking. Are you telling me, God, that you could use a nation, not a nation, a terrorist organization like ISIS to judge a nation like America? Let me tell you, America's bad, but America's not as bad as ISIS, right? I mean, I've been out of America enough to know that, all right? America's got its problems, but they're not the problems of the rest of the world. And yet God says, I got a plan. I got a plan. And only the inside, those that are seeking the Lord, only those that are pressing in hard after the Lord will understand. Now, uh, it, it's kind of like Habakkuk is woke, beginning to wake up to what the, what the real problem is. This will make more sense as we, uh, as we go along. Let's read on here in uh, verse number 14. After he said that you're of purer eyes than us, he, Habakkuk goes on, Why do you make men like the fish of the sea, like reptiles and creeping things, that have no ruler and are defenseless against their foes. The Chaldean brings all of them up on his hook, and he catches them and drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is in high spirits. Therefore, he sacrifices offerings to his net, and he burns incense to his dragnet, because from them... He lives luxurious, and his food is plentiful and rich. Shall he therefore continue to empty his net and mercilessly go on slaying nations forever? You know, Habakkuk is fighting this fight in prayer. And he feels led to tell God how bad the Chaldeans are. You know, like God doesn't know how bad they are. But if it was bad before, if I was burdened before, now I'm really burdened. That doesn't seem possible that you could have a nation more wicked than us rise up and, and, and judge us. 
Now remember, God had given a little clue there in the beginning of what was going to happen. And I mentioned that earlier. He said their strength is going to be in their God. And now Habakkuk gives us here this illustration of fishermen. And he says, these Chaldeans are like a bunch of fishermen. They go out and they have a good catch of fish. And because the fishing was so good, they come home and they worship their nets and their rod and their reel. And that seems foolish. But you know that's what humanity has done over and over and over throughout all of history? And when they begin doing that is when you can almost set the clock as far as judgment. See, God allowed the Babylonians to be raised up and to bring judgment upon people that were more righteous than they themselves were because God had a big picture. God had a plan. But the, their downfall, and next chapter we're going to see some details of this. Their downfall was, but once they started worshiping their rods and their nets and thinking that they did it themselves, God, God said, okay, your time is up. Habakkuk wasn't far off in what he was saying. Lord, we shall not die. Because God had made a covenant with His people that they wouldn't die. But what he didn't understand was that there was going to be a captivity between uh, the, you know, uh, Judah and Israel being brought back to life and so forth. Uh, I don't know if any of you had a, a chance to, to uh, watch Benjamin Netanyahu's speech uh, to the United Nations. One of the comments that he made that I thought was really cool, he was saying, basically, he's not going to let Iran nuke them. I'm just paraphrasing it. And he says, I want to send a message to uh, some of the powers of the world. He said, Israel is a small nation, but we date back at least 4,000 years in antiquity. And he said, I would like you to know that there was a great nation called Babylon that rose up, but Babylon is gone now. There was a great nation called Rome that rose up, but Rome is gone now. However, the Jewish nation is alive and intact. Uh, it gave me goosebumps. It was a powerful, powerful soundbite. Habakkuk wasn't... See, Habakkuk thought he was on track. He thought he understood what was going on. But what he didn't understand was that God had a bigger picture and a bigger program than he could even wrap his mind around. And what, what we're seeing... And this is kind of cliffhanger week. It's going to get stronger and stronger as we go on here. But what we're going to see is that because Habakkuk sought God and he loved God, he was a man that was in transition. His views had to change. And now, before God's going to tell him in the next chapter, Habakkuk, okay, we'll talk about the Babylonians. We'll talk about their judgment. Because yes, they are more unrighteous than you. But before we talk about them, we're going to talk about you. <laughs> and before we talk about the Jewish nation, Habakkuk, we're going to talk about you. And he's going to go on in chapter 2 where he says, my just shall live by faith. See, because judgment always begins at the house of God, doesn't it? And Habakkuk, though he was a good man after God's own heart, a prophet of God, Habakkuk, you know, his beliefs were right, and yet he wasn't living by faith where he should have been. Some people could challenge that, but I think you can see it in the transition. He came in with the burden. God showed him the big picture. Then Habakkuk becomes more burdened. And as we uh, conclude these last few minutes this morning, Really, I probably should have put more emphasis on this part, but look at, we're going to conclude with the first verse of chapter 2. Oh, I know I have been rash to talk out plainly this way, God. I will in my thinking stand upon my post of observation and station myself on the tower or the fortress and will watch to see what He will say to me. And what answer I will make as his mouthpiece to these perplexities of my complaint against him. Now, that's cool. That's the Amplified. But I want to read that in the New King James Version. Okay, this is chapter 2, verse 1. It has more of a poetic feel to it here in New King James. It says, Habakkuk says, I will stand my watch and I will set myself on the rampart. And I will watch to see what he will say to me, and what I will answer, and what I will answer when I am corrected. So Habakkuk is saying, he's just admitting, I don't understand this stuff. I don't understand how this nation could be falling apart, first of all, and why we haven't been judged yet. God answers it, and then he says, I don't understand how you could use people more wicked than us 
to judge us. And he's quite frankly admitting, I don't understand this. These people, you know, they worship the works of their own hands. They don't worship you. I don't understand this. But we're about to see the character of a godly man come out here. He says, I'll set myself on my watchtower. That's such a beautiful imagery. I'll set myself upon my watchtower. Now, he wasn't a Jehovah Witness. <laughs> Janet and I were talking about the Jehovah Witnesses earlier. He wasn't a Jehovah Witness. He's not talking about the magazine, is he? He's talking about the place of prayer. You see, Habakkuk had some problems <laughs> because he was human, because his mind couldn't conceive the breadth and the depth and the scope of God's plan. He couldn't wrap his mind around all of this stuff, but he said, God, I'll set myself in a place of prayer. In other words, God, I'm not going nowhere until you answer me. Sometimes we just got to get anchored down in the watchtower. And he says, by the way, God, you're perfect and I'm not, so I know I must be wrong here. <laughs> and I'll stand corrected. But until I know where, until you show me where I have to be corrected, I'm not going anywhere. It's a trait of godly men and women. If you remember, Moses, God communed with him as a friend. And we, we talk about Moses, but sometimes we forget that there was a guy named Joshua that stuck around after the party was over. Joshua stayed in the tent of meeting, and he basically said, God, I'm not going anywhere. I don't care if your manifest presence is coming here or just the remnants of your glory. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying in the tent of meeting. And because he was a godly man, you see how God over and over used Joshua. We're not perfect, but if we'll learn to set ourselves in a place of prayer, and we're not talking about just telling God everything that we want. We're talking about a place of prayer where we can get the heart of God, where we can begin to get out of our puny little minds and step into the bigger plan of God, where we can be anchored in that watchtower. Because guess what? Once we get the message, once we really get it, it's going to be our job to notify everybody else. But God's looking for people that won't just parrot what everybody else has said. He's looking for people that won't just you know, say what the prophetic leaders of the day are saying. God is looking for a people that will stand their watch. That they'll get a clear message from God and then they'll sound the alarm. He's not looking for perfect people. We've already said it over and over. Habakkuk wasn't perfect. But he was a man who said, Lord, I don't understand it, but you can correct me. And wow, what an amazing transformation we're going to see of this man in chapter 3. He goes from sobs to song. From complaining to celebration. In the beginning, he's bewildered. And he doesn't understand. But he humbles himself in prayer. And he sets himself like a man on his watchtower. Friends, let me tell you, when you've heard God, it'll be bigger than you can do and bigger than I can do, and it'll challenge our puny understanding. But if we'll set ourselves in a place of humble watching and prayer, God will show us the steps. He'll show us the way to get from here to there, and He'll transform us in the pro uh, process. Uh, let's go to Ecclesiastes uh, 5, 1-7. through let me just remind you that this started out as a study on prayer and God made it something much more than just that. But Ecclesiastes 5 from another wise man called Solomon. Verse 1, he says, Walk prudently when you go to the house of God. Draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know what they do wrong, or they do not know what they do is evil. Do not be rash with your mouth. Do not let your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes through much activity and a fool's voice is known by his many words. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it. For He has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. It is better not to vow than to vow and not to pay. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say to the messenger of God that it was in error. Sorry, why should God be angry at your excuse? 
and destroy the works of your hands. For in the multitude of dreams many and many words, there is vanity, but fear God. The message that Solomon had here, which was in the message to Habakkuk and the message for us today, because that's why we're in the book, right? To, to get the message. Is to understand that a lot of times we're not going to understand. But if we set ourselves in the place of prayer, and if we come before God's presence, sincerely asking Him to teach us, to correct us, to instruct us, we're going to see things that we may not want to see. But God's going to transform us in the process. And God's going to use us as a mouthpiece. You see, so often the sound is unclear. And the Apostle Paul writes another place. He says, if the trumpet sounds a distorted sound, who's going to know what to do? The way they moved the people was with the sound of the trumpet. The man who was on the watchtower had different trumpet sounds that he would sound for different situations. And Habakkuk is saying, Lord... I don't understand this one bit. I'm not real happy about what you're showing me either. But I know that the error must be with me, not with you. So I'm going to set myself here not telling you what to do. You see, up to this point, he's been telling God what to do. Told him how evil the Judeans were and the political situation in Judah. Then God said, I'm sending the the Chaldeans, the uh, uh, Babylonians. And, And Habakkuk reminded God of how bad the Babylonians were and how that's not a good thing to do, God. And so finally, Habakkuk comes to himself and he finally says, okay, God, I don't understand what you're doing. I'm just admit it. I don't understand what you're doing. I'm just going to set myself in my watchtower. I'm going to listen for the voice of God. I'm going to watch for God's plan. I'm going to allow the Holy Ghost to transform my understanding and my thinking. And I am going to be changed by the power of God. And I'm going to get the word from God so that then I can proclaim it with clarity. This is all connected. See, we like the quote, the verse that says, write the vision down, make it plain. You know, and Habakkuk's the one who said that. But Habakkuk only got the plain vision after he waited upon the Lord. Now, we talked earlier about, you know, we don't need to tarry on uh, for the Holy Ghost. You know, don't mix up conversations here. The Holy Ghost has been given. We can receive the Holy Ghost freely. What we do need to tarry for sometimes is to hear the voice of God. To know what God is saying in our current situation. That's why we meditate upon the Scriptures. We wait upon the Lord. We take it before God. Uh, uh, There's always an answer. I believe that. There's always an answer, but sometimes we're going to have to seek God for it a little bit longer. I I still remember Creflo Dollar's story of how and he was diagnosed with a very bad form of cancer. And he said, I don't understand that, God. And so Creflo Dollar, a Bible and a gallon of water went into a room for three days. And he came out cancer free. You see, the Word is going to be tested. We've got to learn to set ourselves in our watchtower. But let me tell you, once you've received the Word of God, you'll know how to alert other people, how to tell other people. Instead of us just proclaiming what everybody else is proclaiming and being an echo, we can be a voice for God in this world. And that's the difference. Every church has some system in place. And systems, you know, they, they can be used to work for the glory of God. But I don't want to just for, for you know, five years tell you what John Maxwell said in some book. I want a, a word from God. I want to be the voice of God. And I want to be able to speak what God is speaking plainly. And I want to be able to step into realms that I can't understand with my own understanding. But to know that if I'll wait upon the Lord, if I'll seek the Lord, that God will reveal to us with clarity what His plan is. In terms of the prophetic gifts, I very often am gifted at seeing the big picture of things. I can do that when I'm reading books of the Bible. Usually I can read it, and boom, 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 here's the central theme, big picture of things in the book of the Bible. Uh, I'm very gifted in that. Let me tell you where I failed a lot, and I don't mind being transparent. There's a lot of steps between where I'm at right now and where I'm going in the big picture. And if we don't wait in the watchtower, if we don't wait before the Lord and let the Holy Spirit lead us step by step and be led by the Spirit of God, there's a lot of things that can wipe us out between right here where I'm at and where I'm going. I'm telling you, it's going to be tested. I'm telling you, whatever you believe God for is going to be tested. But if we'll wait upon the Lord and be led by the Holy Spirit, God will show us the steps. Step here, step there. Miss that landmine? 
miss that pitfall. Step here, step there. Friends, we got to be a people of prayer. Be a people of faith, yes. Be a people of the Spirit, yes. But we got to be a people of prayer. And Habakkuk, when he started out, was just expressing all the concerns of every other godly person in the nation. How long till you judge? Sounds a little bit like America today, doesn't it? Huh? I mean, because the godly have a collective voice in America today. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. But God is saying, sure, judgment's coming because it's coming upon all the nations of the world. But if you'll press in, I'll show you more of the steps in the plan. I'll show you the big picture, but I'll show you how to have mercy in the midst of judgment. And we're going to see it in chapter number two. As the people of God, we can have the greatest revival in the midst of judgment. Because what's judgment for the world can be revival for the people of God. Let me tell you, when there's a drought and nobody else's garden will grow, but your garden has the biggest pumpkins in history, that's a witness to the world. Amen. (laughs) God's people can prosper in the midst of judgment. But we better... Stop just listening to the echo and we better become a people that press in with God to hear the voice of God for ourselves. Because we have a job to do. We have a place to stand on the wall. If we're not standing in our place upon the wall watching and praying, then the enemy might enter through that place. But if we're standing in that place of prayer before the Lord, then first of all, we're going to be transformed. But second of all, we're going to be able to sound the alarm to other people. Amen?